Good morning, Trinity. Am I? Uh, yeah, I'm on. All right. I'm all hooked up to something back here. Well, welcome, everybody. My name is Mike. I'm one of the elders here at Trinity. We are happy to have you here. If you are visiting, there is a, a little pamphlet that you'll see as you're walking in at that table. There's also some out there in the lobby. That uh, just kind of tells you a little bit about who we are as a congregation, but most importantly, um, on the, the second page of that little pamphlet, you'll, you'll see an explanation of what Christians call the gospel. That's the central teaching of the, of the Christian faith, and so I encourage you to check that out. A couple announcements. Coming up in June, we're organizing a, uh, a service event at Feed My Starving Children. If you've never been to Feed My Starving Children, it's kind of a blast. I mean, they, they just have this thing, uh, you know, work down to a, a well-oiled machine. You, you, you show up, and essentially you're packing food to be sent all over the globe for kids who, uh, who, who are, are living in food deserts or are, are really living in a, in a spot where there's very little food. So that will be on June 18th. That'll be Friday, early evening. You could set some up with your community group to grab dinner afterward or something like that. But the RSVP info is online. Secondly, uh, we are in need of volunteers for just different odds and ends around uh, Sunday mornings. That would include greeting and uh, uh, children's ministry. But also this summer, on, on the second uh, Sunday of each month, we're going to be doing outdoor services again. And so we just need folks that are, are willing to show up a little bit early to, to sort of... Um, you know, bring everything out, set up the, the canopies, stuff like that. So if you're into grunt labor, uh, then this one's for you. So if, uh, if you are available to volunteer, we really encourage you to, to do that and to reach out um, online or, uh, or grab one of the staff members after church to find out how to volunteer. Well, with that, if you are able, would you stand and we will begin with a call to worship. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. We come before the Lord this morning recognizing that we are people in need of grace, and so we're, we, we well, come before the Lord this morning with a confession from the Book of Common Prayer. It should show up on the screen behind me. Join me. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and apart from your grace, there is no health in us. O oh Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare all those who confess their faults. Restore all those who are penitent, according to your promises declared to all people in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O oh most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may now live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the Lord Jesus Christ, we have an imperishable hope, an imperishable hope that is more firm uh, than our sin, more firm even than death itself. As we approach the Lord this morning, let's not only confess our sin, but confess our faith. This is a confession of faith based on 1 Corinthians 15, and that should be on the screen behind me as well. So let me begin. I tell you this, brothers and sisters, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the, Im the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, 
always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Let's worship him together.
Fill the air. 
So if you have not heard of Informed Choices, they are um, an excellent organization, and I, uh, we're always excited to, to take part in the Baby Bottle Campaign every year, so I encourage you to, to participate in that if you're able. Uh, but moreover, uh, check out Informed Choices, learn everything you can about them, because they are an excellent group. If you would join me in prayer this morning as I, as I start. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. I pray that as we approach your word, your spirit would already be working to, to um, make clear to us how we might respond to you. I pray that, that by the promises that you gave to, um, gave to the prophets that we, would, uh, that we would be comforted and that we would have hope um, and that that hope would drive us into the world to, to act as, um, as, the, uh, as partakers in your plan. Um, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So today is our last sermon for our series on, on comfort. So we, we began with Michael talking about worry and the way and the promises that we have in Scripture about how the Lord provides and how the Lord meets our needs. And then John talked about health challenges. Um, and then last week we talked about just sort of want in general and, and what the Scriptures have to say about that. And then today we're closing out the series. And what we're ta- talking about is a word for hopelessness. We're talking about what the Scriptures say to someone who is hopeless. So when I say hopelessness, I have two things in mind. So the first thing is probably what most of us associate with hopelessness. This is somebody who looks out into their future, and, uh, and what they see is just, um, just, un- it's just unavoidably defeating. So this is someone who's experiencing despair, that where there, there's no way that they can imagine things playing out in their favor. It's, um, there's a, a sense of pointlessness, and it's uh, and they're in the grip of, uh, of the, the, uh, sort of a panicked emotional state, a, a despairing emotional state. That's what we tend to associate with hopelessness, so I'm speaking to that this morning. But I also want to include another kind of hopelessness, not despair, but apathy. There's a kind of hopelessness that takes place. It, it comes from the same thing. It comes from this sense of futility about the future. But rather than uh, resulting in this kind of shaking your fist at the heavens, instead it just results in... A, a kind of giving up, a kind of uh, uh, lack of participation in life. Um, instead, it's just sort of like, I'm, I'm just going to show up, go home, and, and then go to sleep, and tomorrow I'll do the same thing. So what, what, what Christian hope does, it speaks to both kinds of hopelessness, both despair and apathy. Christian hope defies both of these things. So to those who are despairing, it lifts their spirits, But to those who are apathetic, it gets their feet moving. Christian hope lifts our spirits and gets our feet moving. So uh, I want to show this from the way that hope is talked about in the New Testament. So Paul, in 1 Corinthians 15, he talks about the great hope that Christians have in Christ, the hope of the the resurrection. And after he's done with that little section, it's the section that we did a responsive reading on, after he's done sort of describing that hope in very poetic terms, uh, he, he describes what he thinks is the natural consequence of this hope that we have. And he says that, that Christians will be immovable, abounding in good work. So it lifts their spirits, but then the natural consequence of Christian hope is that it gets their feet moving as well. Peter, in his first letter, he says that because of the hopes that, hope that Christians have in Christ, they endure trial. So again, it's, it's a kind of comfort that gets us moving out into the world. So in other words, Christian hope doesn't comfort us like a lazy boy, right? It it doesn't put us to sleep. It wakes us up. So uh, uh, throughout this series, we've seen how God is a good father, and he comforts his children like a good father. So what does a good father do? Well, sometimes a good father comforts his child by rocking them back to sleep, right? They wake up with a nightmare. They're worried about something, and a good father puts them at ease, right, and then lays them back in bed, right? So that's sort of the sort of comfort that we get from God in response to our worry. God will provide. So a good father will put his kids at ease. Um, But then sometimes a good father comforts his kid by clapping him on the back, you know, and sending him back into the game. Like, you got this, buddy, you know, and then you're, you're off again. That sometimes that's how a good father comforts his child, and that is the kind of comfort that Christian hope is. It en- Courages literally puts courage into us. Now, the Christian hope is kind of interesting 
when a Christian talks about their hope, you know, we use this word hope, but we're not really, what we mean is not something we're crossing our fingers for, right? So, so we're not saying, well, I really hope, you know, the stars align and this thing works out. You know, that's not so much what we mean by hope when we're talking about the Christian hope. Instead, the Christian hope is present assurance from a future reality. The Christian hope is a present assurance that we get from a future reality. So when you're kids, when you're a kid, your, your parents might have read you stories, and some of those stories might have been pretty dark. And so what, what does a little kid do? They, they turn to their parents and they say, does this have a happy ending? And the parent's like, I can't tell you that. And then they bother the parent a little bit more and like, fine, no, yeah, it has a happy ending. Can we just read now? So what happens then? Well, you know the ending, <laughs> right? So the story's still dark. The story that you're going through right now is still dark, but the way you're experiencing the story is completely different because you know it has a good ending. So Christian hope is like that. We know that when all is said and done, this thing will end well. This thing will have a happy ending, and so we are getting present assurance from that future reality. But also this changes how we relate to the present. So let's say, you know, let, you know, the kid asks, you know, is this a happy ending? Is this a happy ending? Well, what, what happens at that point then? The, the, the kid has to wonder, okay, well, things look really grim right now. So how is the author going to get this from point A to point B? And so the, 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 there, there's a kind of uh, being present that the kid begins to, to experience because he knows it's a happy ending where he's taking part in the story in a different way, precisely because he's wondering, man, however the author's going to get from point A to point B, it's got to be amazing. And so I'm in for the ride. So the Christian hope also uh, helps us in the present. It changes how we relate to the events of our life and how we uh, relate to just the fact of human history itself. What history is really about can only be, be determined by its ending. So if we know the ending, then we know something about what history is going to be all about. It's all going to be about the reign of Christ and the grace of God. And so that changes how we relate to the news. It changes how we relate to, uh, to uh, just the different events that take place in our lives and, and how we relate to politics, how we relate to, uh, to, to entertainment, to all these different things, because we know that all of this is happening in a story with a good ending. So what I want to do today is I wa want to walk through two chapters in the book of Isaiah. And first what I want to show is why we're certain, and then I want to, to say what we're certain about. So in other words, given that, that there's a God, given that Christ is, uh, is the Lord, um, how can we be certain that God will act on these promises? And then I want to ask, what are we certain about? So first, why we're certain. So today I'm working out of Isaiah 44, or 54 and 55. Uh, so this is a prophecy that was delivered to Israel when they were in exile. So they, they, Israel was sent into exile because they had again and again broken what was called the covenant. So a relationship with God takes place on certain terms, and, and we call that a covenant. And so Israel had again and again broken the covenant, and God had again and again forgiven until this particular point where Israel was, was uh, exiled out of their land, and they were taken into uh, Babylon. And so uh, the way to think about this is sort of like this. So um, again and again, God had cause to bring about the consequences of Israel's sin. And again and again, he passed up on that until this point. So this is sort of like you can imagine a, a man who's married to a woman, and the woman again and again goes off and, and has an affair. She, she's just a, a serial adulteress. And she goes off again and again and has an affair, and then eventually things fall apart for her and she returns. And, and every time she returns, the husband receives her back, right? So he, he says, you know, I forgive you. I, I, you know, um, even though I have cause to divorce you, I'm not going to. Uh, so he receives her back again and again. But then eventually you can imagine that even with that very patient husband, like the one I have in mind, there, there comes a point where he will no longer reinstate the covenant of marriage, right? There comes a point where he will no longer say all is well, you know, and, and he will enact the divorce. That's how we should understand Israel's exile. 
So Israel goes off into exile like a shamed wife being kicked out of the house. That's what's going on there. It's the, it's the husband saying, I'm not taking you back this time. And so Israel goes into exile. And while they're in exile, they, they've suffered all this, all this pain and all this trial, and a word comes to them from the Lord through, uh, through Isaiah, or, or, or at this point in the book of Isaiah, this is probably the disciples of Isaiah. Uh, but a word comes to Israel, and that's what I want to read right now out of chapter 54. God says this, Fear not, for you will not be ashamed. Be not confounded, for you will not be disgraced. For you will forget the shame of your youth, and the reproach of your widowhood you will remember no more. For your maker is your husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and the Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer, the God of the whole earth he is called. For the Lord has called you like a wife deserted and grieved in spirit, like a wife of youth when she is cast off, says your God. For a brief moment I deserted you, but with great compassion I will gather you. In overflowing anger for a moment I hid my face from you, but with everlasting love I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. This is like the days of Noah to me. As I swore that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, so I have sworn that I will not be angry with you and will not rebuke you. For the mountains may depart and the hills be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you, and my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. So what God says in that that poem is he, at one point he mentions, this is like the days of Noah to me. So what what does that image mean? So uh, when we think of the word covenant, if if you've sort of, uh, you know, walked in as a Christian for a while, you're probably familiar with the term covenant, and when you hear the term covenant, you either think of Mount Sinai, and there's, you know, thunder and peals of, you know, peals of thunder and and flashing of lightning, or you think of Jesus at the Last Supper, right, talking about the new covenant. But uh, the, the other covenant that we tend not to talk about very much is the covenant of creation itself, that there are, uh, there's a covenant just by the fact of God making, we have responsibilities to God as his creation. And so it's kind of like how you, when you're born, you instantly have responsibilities to your parents, right? You, don't, you, you didn't sign a contract for that. You didn't negotiate terms. <laughs> you know, it's just a given that you have responsibilities to your parents uh, just by the fact of them giving you life. Well, in the same way, uh, you, you, know, you could describe that as a kind of covenant, like a kind of of responsibility uh, that goes back and forth. In the same way, because of the fact of creation, just the givenness of your life, you have responsibilities to God. So at the beginning of the scriptures, we have this moment where God establishes creation, uh, humanity uh, rebels, and then the rebellion just gets worse and worse and worse. And uh, there's kind of this lingering question at the opening pages of the the Bible, will God uncreate? You know, what's God going to do with this? Is, is he going to just let this go on, or will he do something about this race called humanity that keeps on uh, rebelling? So eventually he does, and that's the, the famous flood story. God is literally uncreating the world at that point. And then he, he starts fresh with this, this family, um, Noah's family, and he reinstates the whole covenant. He, he reiterates the very same words from the first chapter of, of Genesis. So he, he puts the covenant back in place, and he tells them, I will never again break, like, I'll I'll never again, uh, uh, you know, bring about the curses of this covenant. So in other words, like, humanity broke the covenant. God brought about the the consequences. When God reinstates the covenant, he says those consequences will never come about again. I will never uncreate. I will never respond to sin through mass destruction again. And so it's this firm, everlasting covenant that, that cannot be broken because God has, has made it part of the terms of the contract that he will never break it. And so what, what, what God is saying in, in Isaiah is that there's a new covenant coming, uh, a new way that he's going to relate to people, and the terms of this covenant will be unbreakable. He, w- he will arrange things so that he never uh, brings about the consequences of, of this new covenant on the people who are in that new covenant. This one will stand. So uh, how does he accomplish that? 
Well, we, suddenly what we, what we see is, is God becomes a man. God becomes Jesus of Nazareth. The Son becomes one of us, and he lives the life of someone who keeps covenant. See, there's always this problem, you know, like if, uh, if, if we're in a covenant with God, he's going to keep his end because he's God, and he's faithful. That's his nature. Uh, the, the, the problem is actually with us. People are not so faithful. And so there's kind of this worrisome thing that happens. You know, we even see it in the, in the story of, of Sinai when Israel's brought into covenant, that they tremble at the fact of being brought into this arrangement with God because they know that they're going to be the problem, not God. And so what Jesus does is he shows up and he lives the life of someone who keeps covenant. He lives the life of someone who never breaks their side of the bargain. And he stands in our place. Jesus is the people of God. What, what happens through Jesus' life is he, he essentially lives the life that we were meant to live, and then he dies the death of a covenant breaker. He lives as a covenant keeper, dies as a covenant breaker. And so he dies the death that each of us would otherwise be destined for, a kind of rejection from God. And he gifts to us, gifts to us, his own life. So when God considers us, he considers us on the merits of the perfect covenant keeper, not the, a covenant breaker like we are. And so that's, uh, so what, what God has essentially done, you know, you can, you can imagine yourself, you're about to buy a house, uh, you know this lender's really trustworthy, you're, so you're entering into a kind of covenant with them, this, this uh, mortgage contract. But you know, as you're signing all these dotted lines and you're putting in your earnest money and, and that sort of thing, you know that you're actually, in the end of all this, you're not going to have enough to close the deal. So the closing costs, right, at the end of the— you, you know that you don't have enough money for that. And so you're starting to sweat a little bit. Uh, but in this situation, normally we'd be, we'd be in deep trouble. In this situation, someone comes along and gifts us the funds for the closing costs. So then we, we, we are able to keep our end, um, but on, the, on the, the basis of the riches of the giver. Christ is the giver. God has arranged the new covenant so that he assures both sides of the bargain. On the one hand is the faithfulness of God, and on the other is the blood of Christ. Does that make sense? I just threw a lot at you in a very short amount of time. Uh, th that's good? Okay. So... God has, has assured both sides of the bargain. So what that means is that when God tells us promises, like, the, like in this passage, promises based on a new covenant, it means that we can trust him to keep his promise. That this covenant is fail-safe. So that's why we're certain of God's word. But what are we certain about? So let me read Isaiah 55, and I'm actually going to read the whole chapter. So this is the response, poetically, in, in the passage, this is kind of the, the response that God is, is inviting us to have, given the fact of this new covenant. He says, Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread? and your labor for that which does not satisfy. Listen diligently to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live, and I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. Behold, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples, Behold, you shall call a nation that you do not know, and a nation that did not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God and of the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon for my thoughts are not, this is God speaking, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty 
it will accomplish that which I purpose, and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy, and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle, and it shall make a name for the Lord, an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. So notice in this passage, early on in, that, in what I just read, which, what a stunning piece of poetry. Um, early on in, in that passage, he mentions the Lord's sure love for David. So that, that, can, it's, that can kind of seem like it's coming out of nowhere. Why, why are we mentioning David, some ancient king? Um, basically, the reason David comes up is, is in, in the Hebrew mind, in, he, in the prophetic poetry of the Hebrews, David was sort of a stand-in for um, the ideal king. Right? He had his faults, he had immense faults, but he was promised that from his line would come this ultimate king um, called Meshiach, Messiah, or, or Christ in the Greek. Uh, and so sometimes the poets will mention David, and what they're mentioning is that God has promised a, a descendant of David who will come and, and be the ultimate king. And so the, the passage here uh, is, is about this new covenant, and what Isaiah says is that this new covenant is going to come about through Messiah. The new covenant will come about because of this descendant of David who will be the Christ. Christ is the reason for our hope. We have reason to hope because of Christ's kingdom, and specifically his resurrection. In his resurrection, Christ's kingdom is inaugurated. In, his resurrection, in, in our resurrection, his kingdom will be consummated. And I want to take each of those at, uh, at, at, a t- at a time. So first, in his resurrection, Christ's kingdom is inaugurated. So here's, here's what I want us to, to think about. When a president is inaugurated, what, what happens? So um, when a president's inaugurated, let's, let's take the Eisenhower to Kennedy transition, just to avoid you know, uh, modern politics. <laughs> uh, you know, it's like, well, you mentioned him first, so you must be more on his side. Just don't read into it. Um, so let's take Eisenhower and Kennedy. Um, so when Kennedy was inaugurated, he was inaugurated into Eisenhower's America. Okay? So Eisenhower's policies were in place. Eisenhower had been the one signing the bills. He'd been the one doing executive orders at probably a, a much smaller rate than we have in the past three presidencies. But in any ways, he, he was doing executive orders. You know, he was the commander in chief, so the military was, was uh, you know, uh, acting on, on, on his council. So Kennedy is inaugurated into Eisenhower's America. So even though Kennedy is the president, it looks like Eisenhower's America. And then he gets to work. So he's inaugurated, and then he starts signing bills. He, he starts issuing his own executive orders. He starts doing his thing, and then suddenly, Eisenhower's America gets taken over by Kennedy's America. Slowly, it becomes clear that this is, this is, this is the effect of Kennedy being the one who's ruling right now. Jesus' inauguration, Jesus' kingdom, works the same way. So Jesus is inaugurated through his death, resurrection, and ascension. When Jesus rises from the dead, he comes into power. And yet he comes into power into a world that doesn't look like Jesus' world. And then he releases the church. And then he releases his spirit. And slowly but surely, the gospel, the good news of what Jesus has accomplished, begins to work its way out in the world. The story shifts from, from one of just hopeless, cyclical pain to one where there is clearly a force in the world that is operating and it is bringing things, drawing things under the kingdom of Christ. So here's just a couple, if you're, if you're skeptical about, about this way of imagining history itself, um, then let me point you to the Bible. Jesus said that his kingdom would grow like a mustard seed that is planted 
and grows invisibly underground and then breaks earth and branches out and bursts into leaf. And finally, it's a giant tree in the bird's nest in its branches. Jesus said that his kingdom is like a pinch of yeast that you put into a, a ball of dough. You don't see the yeast multiplying, but suddenly you, you wake up the next morning and the, the ball of dough is a lot bigger than it was, right? So the, the yeast is slowly working its way out in the world. Jesus said that the news of the gospel would make its way into all the nations. We can take uh, Isaiah, these very chapters, um, and, and this is leaving out a, a whole bunch of other parts of Isaiah that also talk about this very same thing. In the previous chapter of Isaiah, we, we saw how uh, God's faithfulness will vindicate his people in front of the world. Here in chapter 55, we're told that the Messiah will be a witness to the nations. There's this consistent idea that uh, when Messiah is enthroned, his rule will break out into the world and God's operations will be visible to those who know where to look. And it will happen right in the middle of this fallen world and his people will be participants in the process. Just through the simple act of obedience and faith. So what this means is that while the Christian hope is uncompleted, it is underway. The Christian hope is uncompleted, but it is underway. Jesus is claiming ground. So even when you know the ending of the story, sometimes uh, getting there is part of the joy. Even if you know how an author is going to finish the story, you still find yourself delighted by how he unveils the details. What is happening right now is that the gospel is going out to the nations. God is gathering people in. And this is, is not a work that gets, that gets completely completed until the return of Christ. That's when, when things will be brought to an end. And yet, here we are in the middle of the story, 2,000 years later. And we can look around, and we can see that the grace of God has been demonstrated through beauty and hospitals, and innovations in art, and orphanages, and city architecture, and the Western literary canon, and representative government, and free speech, the right of habeas corpus, the philosophy of the rule of law, cathedrals, the abolition of slavery, the Ninth Symphony, and the Dutch masters. I could go on. All of these are signs of a world that has been caught in a downpour, and there's nowhere to run for cover. Even if they don't want to be in the rain, it's dripping off the brim of their hat. The grace of God has fallen on this world, and its evidence is everywhere, if you know where to look. But what this also means is that your life, your life, no matter the circumstances, is part of the unfolding of God's plan. No matter what you face, do not despair of your life. Live it. One, uh, one pastor says this, all of our stories, all of them, trillions of stories, the whole thing is going to come together on the last day with trillions of plot points all resolved and no remainder. All the tattered stories, all the billions of tattered stories that attend God's people all over the world, the persecuted saints who are at this moment crying out for deliverance are going to be resolved and the great throng will be gathered before the throne, and they will cry with a voice like many waters, saying, that was the best story we ever heard. Christ's kingdom is inaugurated, and your life is a part of it. Which means that as you are in the confusion of your moment, all that's really happening is that you're wondering how the author is going to get you from point A to point B. He will. And the evidence is in 2,000 years of the gospel claiming ground. The evidence is in your own life and the way in which Christ works in his people. The evidence, most of all, is in the fact of Christ's resurrected body. So don't despair of your life. Play the man. Christ's kingdom is inaugurated. 
but one day it will be uh, what theologians call consummated. The, the kingdom of Christ will be consummated. So, which means that it will be made fully visible. It will be brought to completion. Christ will, will return. Uh, that's what theologians call the parousia, or the, you know, the, the, the second coming of Christ. And what Christ does at, 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 his, at his return is he will make all things new. So what this will be like, we have no exact idea, um, but we're confident that it will be new. <laughs> it will be a new thing. So when Paul, when Paul is trying to explain what, what Christians talk about, when we're talking about our resurrection, right? So, so in, in his resurrection, Christ's kingdom is inaugurated. In our resurrection, his kingdom is consummated. Okay, so when Paul's trying to explain what our resurrection will be like, he says that our resurrection uh, existence will be to present existence what a house is to attend. He says that our resurrection existence will be to our present existence what a big regal oak tree is to the, the green acorn planted in the backyard two centuries ago. Okay? That, that it, there's a connection, there's a continuity between what we're experiencing now and, and what we experienced then, but it's a really new thing, and it's pretty hard to imagine the house when you only have the tent to go off of. Right? But we know that, there's, that it will be something like that. So one of the other things that we have to go on is the body of Christ. So when, when Christ returns from the dead, he, he rises and he's recognizable on one level, and yet he's, he's unrecognizable in another way. So Mary doesn't recognize him at first in the garden. There's two disciples that walk with him for, for some ways, and they don't recognize him until it's in the breaking of bread. And so there's something that's, that, that they know to be Jesus. They recognize him as Jesus, but there's also something new. And, and one of the most remarkable things is that he still has his wounds. So Christ is walking around with, with the, the holes in his hands and his feet and the, the scar in his side. He's, he's still walking around with the stuff that killed him, with the signs of what killed him. And yet they're, they're no longer limiting on him. They're, they're no longer a, 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 uh, a, a cause for distress. Instead, they're a cause for glory. So it's in the same way that you can imagine a, a soldier who takes a shot into the shoulder on the battlefield, and it's really, really bad, right? Like, grazes the artery. He's, you know, is he going to die? Is he going to live? He makes it home. It's a terrible circumstance. It's deeply traumatic. There's going to come a moment later in that man's life where he doesn't try to hide that scar. Instead, he might even unbutton his shirt and, like, show family members, <laughs> right? Be because it's no longer limiting on him. It instead, it's a, it's a reason to glory it's a sign that, like, I was there. I suffered this. And so it's no longer a sign of distress. It's a sign of, of honor. So, so what, what Jesus carrying his scars tells us is that the sorts of things that are defeating to us, especially the things that are offered up in the service of God, they, they carry over not as an as, as a ongoing distress into the new creation, Instead, they carry over as signs of glory. Instead, they demonstrate the way in which God uses even great evil. God uses even the darkest circumstances for his glory, and it will be visible. The future resurrection of the saints means that now is the time for holy risk. There will come a time, in the words of Irenaeus, when we will forget to die. So that shouldn't make us passive now. So there's a, there's a paradox at the bottom of following Jesus. So Jesus said, I, I came to, to give them life, that they should have it abundantly. That's what it is to, to, to follow Jesus, is to tar participate in real life. Reality, life as it actually is, is discovered as you follow Jesus. And yet, how does Jesus describe that process? He says, anyone that would keep his life will lose it. Anyone who will lose his life for my sake will gain it. He, he, he says that, that anyone who would follow me must pick up his cross and follow. Literally, pick up, pick up your execution device. Jesus' call to us, when he, when he tells us to live, 
the very same command is a, is a call to die. And yet in dying, we discover real life. That Jesus, what, you could summarize obedience to Christ, all the commands of Christ, as the command to truly live. Not the command to survive, necessarily, but the command to truly live. What the resurrection of Christ means is that you will have no shortage of life, so you must live. You must live to God. Throw yourself into the task of living. Live consistently with the king who you know to be in power, and live by his way with abandon. Live in the freedom of God's abundant grace. Live with no fear that your sacrifices will be wasted. Live with no fatigue in service. Live with no poverty of love. Live and bring your children up in the Lord. Live and love your husband or wife. Live and be generous. Live and work hard. Live and plant a garden and cook good food and toast each other and build something and have dominion. Don't you know that we will inherit the earth? Live and bear witness to Christ the King. Live and forgive others. Live and confess your sins. Live and worship the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as, the, as yourself. Live and sing together for the heck of it. Live and suffer patiently. Live and stand up under persecution. Live and then die well. We have been, we have been brought into a living hope. And so, so I, I just want to end on this by, say, by saying what a gift your life is. What a gift your life is. And, and, and you might not feel like it's a gift right now. What a gift. Because when all is said and done, only you are going to be the one who, who can tell your story. Only you will be the one who, who will be able to demonstrate to others the way in which God proved himself faithful to you. What a gift your life is. And, and so fearlessly obey. Fearlessly have faith. So that when you tell your story, you can tell a story of, of having lived. Your life is a gift. So don't despair of it. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have brought us into a living hope through the resurrection. God, we pray that you would give us the gift of faith to respond to you. I pray, Lord, that, um, that, we would be, that you would give us eyes to, to recognize that, um, that as we follow you, we are, we are discovering life itself. We are following life itself. Um, and so, Lord, I, I pray that you would draw us into the eternal kind of life. Lord, we praise you. We praise you and we, um, we honor you as the king under whose feet all things will be gathered and in whose name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with us?
victory. Oh, victory, you have won. Victorious, you have come. What was stolen, you brought back. celebrate that sacrifice, that offering of your blood. And what it has done for us, what it means for us, God. I invite you to come forward and receive the elements of communion. If you are a follower of Christ, please join us at this time. And then we will be led in taking it together. the 
God, you are working. And you are carving out spaces for new things. Speaking the truth, you are planting your word in our hearts. Give us faith, call us out of time in the service when uh, we uh, remind ourselves of the gospel, we announce the gospel, and uh, Mike gave us many kind of rich images of what God has done for us and the comfort that we receive uh, from the gospel. Um, And I want to just uh, reflect for a moment on on one of those, um, uh, that image of grace coming down like rain. Um, dripping from our hats if we were only alert to see it. That's the kind of world we live in. Um, we lived for almost 24 years in, in Ethiopia, and Ethiopia has um, a dry season and a rainy season. And, and the dry season can last as much as, as nine months. And usually in the middle of it, there's short rains. Last about a month, and you get a, a brief shower every day, but it kind of, kind of refreshes everything in the middle of that long, dry season. About ten years ago, the dry rains, the the the, the short rains, failed. Uh, there were there was not a drop of rain for almost nine months, and everything was just parched. Um, and then one day in, in early June, um, May is always kind of dry and dusty and, and um, it's the least pleasant month in, in Addis. And this year was more than uh, any other year, just very, very unpleasant. Um, but in early June, um, uh, the clouds formed uh, and, the, and a shower came down. And it had been so dry for so long that, um, that all the people came out of their houses. Uh, and if you know Ethiopians, they don't like to, to, to get wet. They don't like to be in the rain. They think it makes them, you know, there's a cultural belief that you get sick if you get, you know, the smell of rain or the rain on you. So it's not something they do, but this was different. Um, and they all came out of their houses. and. Our house kind of looked down through a valley, and and as everyone came out of their houses and the rain kind of gathered in force, um, the, the women just erupted in this joy cry. It is this they call it a lilta, and the whole valley was filled with this the sound of this this joy cry and just a delight and joy at this rain coming down. And I thought of that uh, not only because this is the very driest part of the year in Ethiopia, but that as Mike had that image of grace falling like rain. And it made me think, well, if there's that much joy, 
coming down like rain if we were alert to it? What would you feel if you were standing under a waterfall? And, and that's what we have at this table. We're standing under a waterfall. I think many people, when they, uh, when they realize that, um, their initial response is, I'm not worthy of that. And if you were to come to the table just as you, I would say, that's right, don't come. Because you're not worthy to stand in that waterfall. But we are in Christ. And he is worthy. And so as you come to the table, there is no one more worthy than you if you are in Christ, the worthy one. No one more worthy than you to drink from the fountain that's flowing in such abundance. So in John 7, Jesus said, the one who believes in me, it will be for him. I will be for him. A spring of water welling up to life. And so we eat and drink in the awareness that we've been given a waterfall from which to drink. Let's eat and drink together.
Amen. Uh, two quick announcements. Next week, one of our, uh, the, the missionaries that we support is coming by to just share about um, what, what he and his family have been up to. That's Moses Kintu, and he'll be sharing briefly in the service. But I encourage you, if you, if you know the Kintus, uh, just make, make sure to make some space after the service to, to catch up and say hi. Um, uh, second announcement. Um, so there's this thing called Trinity Time. <laughs> And, uh, you know, for, for many, many years, we as a church have had uh, just a culture of, um, you know, uh, uh, 10 o'clock start time. That's kind of fuzzy. <laughs> you know, we'll show up when we want to. So um, we as the staff are going to be starting right at 10 for a couple uh, big reasons. Um, mainly, uh, you know, it's, it, it gets harder and harder on our children's volunteers down the children's ministry when uh, the end time is— uh, is known by the Lord, but we, uh, you know, we, um, we don't know what it is. So uh, we just want to be fair to them and, uh, and also fair to the folks that are jumping on virtually uh, because, you know, they're jumping out 10, we're, we're noticing, so we just want, want, we want to honor them on that. Um, so I just encourage you uh, to, to, I don't know, this sounds kind of just blunt, but show up on time. I you, know. <laughs> um, you know, Trinity time is what it is. I get it. It's like a whole cultural shift, but we want to uh, make sure that, that we as a congregation are also being accommodating to newcomers it's a weird experience to uh, start a service with an empty sanctuary and leave it with a mostly full one. Um, so uh, just going to throw that out there. So with that, would you receive the grace? May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace. <laughs>